Well, hello, everyone. Um, we, we've waited our, our requisite two minutes past uh, the hour in order to, uh, to start today's uh, seminar. Uh, I want to welcome everyone to, uh, to today's m and Club seminar. Uh, we're coming up on, I believe, uh, close to 80, if, it's, if this is not the 80th uh, seminar that we've done uh, since COVID was declared in March of last year. Uh, the subject for the webinar today, value creation from the viewpoint of both the buy side and the sell side, uh, will be a very interesting one. Uh, for my part, uh, my name is Eric Cardinal. I am a uh, partner at Oakley's in Montreal, investment banking uh, partner. We are a mid-market uh, firm doing both buy side and sell side mandates. So very interested in the uh, presentation today. Um, I also act as the senior vice president for the M&A club, uh, which is why I'm introducing the club today. A uh, quick word on the club was founded in 2009 by our president, Bram Elkin. We, uh, we were just a few guys in a, in a room at that point. So it was really just a, a city club, um, to be honest. We started in Montreal and it grew out to be a regional club, provincial club, and we are now um, not only pan-Canadian, but we are opening our 19th or 20th club in New York City. Uh, and so we are becoming an international uh, club. The, just, just a word on, on what, what I find is the most interesting thing in the club. We, we, we put this group together in order to put together people that have sell-side mandates and, and possibly people who have buy-side mandates. So to try to match uh, some transactions. I've always found that the M&A market, the investment banking industry is a very relationship-based industry. And so the goal of the club is to get individuals together. We have strived in uh, the COVID environment to try and, and, and keep that up with these webinars. And, uh, and we're anxious to be able to get everyone together because the goal of the club is to get everyone uh, together and to uh, exchange ideas. So without further ado, um, the, the webinar today is put on by the Hamilton Club. Thank you very much for our chapter leaders. Uh, the, we, have, we have two chapter leaders in Hamilton. Uh, Pam Vermeersch is the managing partner of Galling WLG's Hamilton office. She advises on all aspects of, cor of corporate and commercial law. Welcome, Pam. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, everyone, for being here today. And our second chapter leader in Hamilton is Jeremy Bridger. Jeremy is a financial plan planner and wealth advisor with RBC Dominion Securities. Over to you, Pam. Thanks, Eric. Hello, everybody. Welcome to uh, the Hamilton M&A chapter. And a uh, little background. So we traditionally meet the third Wednesday of every month at noon in downtown Hamilton. So like everybody else, we're really looking forward to when we can get back to those face-to-face -face networking opportunities. But at this point, um, Zoom and, and the M&A Club has done a great job of keeping us all connected as we make our way through this pandemic. Um, today, I'm, I'm excited to have the team from BDO with us. And I'm going to do a quick introduction to Jeff Noble first. Uh, and Jeff is a director of business and wealth transition for BDO's private client services group. Uh, and with well over 20 years of coaching experience, working with family enterprises, small select private companies, nonprofits, and really dealing with the transition stage. Um, he's a real expert in some of the topics we're going to talk about today, along with his colleagues. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the privilege of your time today. Omar and I are delighted to be here and I see there's a, a really great turnout. So we will, we will not disappoint. We've got some great information to share. Buy side value creation. A lot of attention gets put when we're buying something. And what this is about is extending diligence beyond financial information to help investors uncover risks that may not be represented in the financials. It may also uncover value creation opportunities within the target's market strategy and operations. The result of buy side value creation, investors make more informed and more confident investment decisions and are able then to accelerate the value capture process. The other side of this, of course, is for the seller. And let's have in our minds that uh, when a private company is being sold, it represents 80% or quite a bit more of that business owner's entire net worth, net worth of his, of his or her family. So sell side value creation is something that we're getting more and more attention toward as it can help with that whole value creation and get the optimal dollar for the seller. So what this is about is aligning 
the company's strategic initiatives and capital investments to the value drivers in the in the company. And we find this is critical to ensuring that your company's efforts and capital are going towards increasing value for your investment. As you know, it is these very value drivers that potential buyers pay for. Oftentimes, these are not well understood by management or ownership. The result of sell-side value creation is strategic initiatives, capital investment, and ultimately enterprise value are optimized. I have with me this morning my colleague Omar. Omar is a senior manager here at BDO, and he is an integral part of our value creation uh, services practice. Omar focuses on both M&A and non-M&A value creation services. With respect to M&A transactions, Omar specializes in strategy and commercial due diligence, HR due diligence, synergy reviews and assessments, carve out due diligence and integration and separation planning and execution for both corporate and private equity clients. Omar has led over 15 due diligence and PMI engagements with a combined transaction value of 5 billion Canadian dollars. Omar has also advised both mid-market private and large corporate clients with performance improvement, growth strategy development and execution. Prior to joining us here at BDO, our Omar was at another large national firm and was growth consultant at a leading mid-market bank where he helped execute multiple strategic growth and new market entry plans for the fastest growing mid-market private companies. Omar, over to you. Thanks, Jeff. And uh, that was uh, quite the introduction. I appreciate that. Uh, and thanks everyone for uh, taking uh, the hour over your lunch to join us. And uh, thank you for the MA Club for having us on. Uh, very excited uh, to be presenting to you today. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll skip over my bio because I think Jeff uh, and knocked it out of the park there. Um, just a quick uh, background about uh, BDO uh, Transaction Advisory Services before we get into the presentation. So we're a we're we're a mid-size we're a mid-market focused uh, global firm, um, and we have 12 MA partners and 100 staff across Canada, and we specialize in providing end-to-end uh, M&A services for, uh, that, that are tailored for the mid-market uh, M&A uh, industry in Canada. Uh, we did over 100 transactions last year, um, and, you know, and, we're, um, and I would, we would say that we're number one in terms of servicing the mid-market uh, within Canada. And then we have, um, across, the, uh, across the M&A lifecycle, uh, we fit in within uh, our practice within value creation, sits within both the buy and sell side. We also have M&A advisory, which focuses on sell side, as well as buy side uh, financial due diligence. So just a quick overview. Um, as, as Jeff mentioned, uh, we're gonna be covering uh, two main topics today. Uh, the first one being uh, buy side value creation and, and uh, the benefits of utilizing enhanced due diligence um, aside from just the traditional financial diligence. And the second piece is, as Jeff mentioned, uh, you know, looking at uh, what are the true value drivers within your business and, and maximize what, what the approach uh, the approach that, that owners should kind of take in ensuring that they get maximum value out of, um, out of their exit. And then we'll, uh, we'll leave some time towards the end for some Q&A. So I always, you know, I always like to kind of uh, start by side value creation uh, conversations with, with asking a simple question to the group and kind of, uh, and, it, and it's a good question. And it's, you know, how often do we think um, M&A deals deliver the expected rate of return for investors. And, and it's, you know, people, and, it, and it's surprising when people actually see these stats, but um, from our experience and most studies that are out there, between 70 to 90% of acquisitions fail to deliver expected return to their investors, which is quite substantial. If you, if you think about um, all the M&A activity that's happening nowadays, and we hear about record number of deals, record number of valuations that are kind of being paid for, for businesses. Um, it's interesting to kind of think that, you know, 70, 90% of those transactions aren't really gonna return the, the uh, you know, the returns that investors are expecting. And and then the, and the next scarier kind of um, stat is that you know we, uh, based on some studies like up to fifty percent of corporate M and A actually end up 
um, destroying shareholder value, um, which is also a, a scary stat. So, so I guess you know the question begs like, why is that? Um, and from our experience, the first uh, the first reason, and it kind of ties to the, the enhanced diligence that we're going to be discussing today, is that investors tend to uh, end up you know they end up overpaying for for the for the target, and 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 as well the target actually the, the the targets operations and markets don't actually end up aligning to the investment thesis that investors went in with, and and the reason why this happens usually is is because um, investors will will not do enough market and operational diligence to to really vet and pressure test the uh, revenue and EBITDA projections that managers have has put forth. And what ends up happening is, um, you know, they um, investors will buy the business, and then once they kind of get in and start going through and understanding the true commercial nature of of the, of the business in terms of how they sell to the different customers and kind of what market uh, segments that they're currently in with their products and services, they quickly realize that they're going to have to uh, invest additional capital to build up new products and services to be able to actually execute in uh, cut market segments that they had estimated where the growth would be coming from. Um, as well, uh, you know, operationally, uh, they might have assumed that the, the, the company had capability to be able to execute certain value creation opportunities or growth opportunities uh, based on what they assumed where the market was. But when they get in, uh, they realize that the company itself is not structured to be able to execute on that growth. And then they, again, have to deploy more capital um, to essentially get to where they need to. So that's kind of, you know, the first uh, issue that we see continuously uh, when we're seeing uh, investors uh, overpaying and, and, and not really understanding the target um, and, and, and buying uh, with a mismatch their original investment thesis. And so that's number one. Uh, the second um, reason why uh, in our experience, what we see uh, that destroys value is uh, investors and management, they underestimate uh, the inherent risks that are involved with uh, doing integrations. Um, and these are risks that even if you know you pay the right price for the business and you write, you buy the right business and the market is, is, is perfect, and you know the, the internally they have the capability to execute. These inherent risks that relate to integrations aren't going to go away, um, and management tends to, in our experience, uh, you know, they don't understand these risks and they don't manage them well, and this leads to a lot of value deterioration during the integration, as well as the prolonged effect of of, um, of, of two businesses not really working as required to you know drive long term value for uh, for investors. Um, so what are these, uh, you know, inherent integration risks? So the first one that we see uh, that we kind of, uh, that, that is a big one is, is synergy and value creation realization risk. And what, what this means is uh, investors, when they go in and they're looking at targets, they, uh, the level of detail that they put into assessing their synergies or, uh, and planning and validating um, for those synergies is, it's not it's not substantial, um, and this is this is a major uh, issue that we see continuously because what happens is you know we hear it all the time where these large corporate transactions get announced and they will throw out synergy figures of billion dollars or two hundred million dollars and so on and so forth, but what what that happen what what you know investors or, or um, uh, you know corporates are doing M and A's in that space, what they don't realize is that those are announced synergies. The, the synergies that actually get realized in those situations can be quite different. Um, and it's a perpetual cycle where uh, investors will base their synergy estimates on a previous transaction, which also just announced synergies, which were tied to another transaction. And it's it, it sets the precedent of uh, basing synergy estimates on you know only announced synergies versus what what are actually realized synergies, and in Canada and in, in, in North America, actually, this is you know this is a big problem. Um, whereas in, in the UK, 
if you actually announce the synergies to as a public company, you have to actually get those synergy estimates audited by a third party. So they have to be a lot more stringent in terms of how they plan and, and kind of come out. So that's a big problem where, uh, you, you know, uh, the bankers will kind of throw out synergy numbers um, and then management will kind of take that as, at face value. And then when they actually go and try to execute on that post close, uh, they quickly realize that, you know, the, those synergies aren't there. So, you know, spending time to really uh, diving into that, uh, uh, you know, pre-signing and kind of uh, uh, pre-closing is, is critical and planning and executing on those is, is what drives those synergies versus just taking them at face value. Um, the functional risk uh, is, is associated with uh, it, just the um, all the functions within the business and the complexities that would be there in terms of people, processes, and systems within HR, finance, IT. And as you're kind of integrating them, um, you know, if you haven't been there, done that, and it's your first kind of integration, you're not going to know what what's kind of coming around the corner and there's going to be issues that you're going to become that that are going to be arising and if you don't know how to mitigate them you're going to run into issues uh, people is some people risk is something that uh, investors or you know companies historically have uh, not taken very seriously but it's a it's a, it's a major driver of, of, uh, of uh, you know value creation where uh, there's cultural dissimilarities between the two companies. Uh, there's resistance, um, uh, perhaps on both sides to the transaction and integration. Um, and, and that uh, inherently leads to, uh, you know, companies on uh, both sides not working properly and efficiently. And the last one that we see over and over again, is just the capacity risk in terms of, you know, management uh, underestimating the actual case that, uh, resourcing that's required to execute on a uh, successful integration. So, you know, so, so these are the two main, main, uh, you know, drivers that we see in terms of, uh, you know, what, what deteriorates value and, and um, uh, within a, within an M&A. So I, I like to visually, you know, draw this out uh, just to kind of uh, show what a typical due diligence and a PMI process is. And you know what we, and then what our proposed and best practice um, process would be. So, in a typical scenario, uh, what tends to happen is the level of effort. You know, the blue is typical. Uh, and the level of effort that management and investors put in in their due diligence and integration and value creation planning before signing is, is you know it's quite low, and it kind of starts ramping up as as they sign and close and then as we get into the integration phase there's like a prolonged um, uh, period of high effort where you're essentially operating two businesses um, and then you're also integrating and then what ends up happening um, you know after 10 to 18 months where we expect most integrations to be kind of complete is that there's a long tail um, of, of integration work that continuously happens to the point where there's really uh, there, there isn't a full integration of the two businesses um, and it just keeps kind of going and uh, typically the two businesses will kind of run um, it's somewhat uh, separate uh, but somewhat integrated but not what they had envisioned and um, so not an ideal situation um, so what, and then if you layer in what, what we call best practice, it kind of shows you the inefficiencies that come up if you use this, if you follow the typical approach. So our, our view is that um, the best, pra best practice is that you actually increase your effort up front. You do a lot more work. You do a lot more diligence um, and integration and evaluation planning up front uh, before you sign the actual, uh, you know, sign and close the transaction. And what this leads to is this, you know, this, well, I'll call it a red, um, you know, blurb of, of value and insights that you're able to capture um, that help inform your integration planning as well as your uh, value creation and synergies planning. And then you essentially, you have all of that ready to go and you're executing on that as soon as you kind of, as soon as you sign and close the transaction. And 
in our experience, that leads to uh, you know, you have successful integration between 10 to 18 months, depending on the complexity of the transaction. Um, and it eliminates this blue blurb, which is, which is, the, which is added complexity that, you know, you don't need to uh, go through as a company, because essentially what you're doing at the, in, in the blue is that you're, you're, instead of uh, focusing on um, going after value creation and synergies, you're essentially putting out fires and your all the inherent risks that we discussed earlier, all those are kind of coming up uh, and you're essentially putting out fires every day. Uh, the functional uh, leads that are managing the integrations don't really have a clear uh, path to kind of come to a solution or, 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 or an answer of the problem. So it's like a prolonged period of, of pain, to be honest, um, where uh, you're putting both the businesses at risk and you're not really capturing any synergies and, and, and and uh, and or value creation initiatives, and lastly, you're also missing out on um, you know you're not going to be realizing uh, the additional value that you would have had had you fully integrated using best practices within 18 months. You're going to have another period of time where uh, you know had you followed the uh, best practice or doing a lot more upfront work, you're going to have more uh, period of um, Miss value here. So it's a good way to kind of highlight what happens um, in a typical transaction and how you can eliminate some of that pain point and risk in the middle by doing a lot more of that front, uh, upfront work. So, so what is that upfront work and, and, and what does that mean and what can, and how can we, what, what does it help inform in terms of the, during the diligence and then as well as the integration and value creation process. So we're, we're big pro proponents of uh, uh, supporting our clients and, 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 and providing them with, um, with commercial and market due diligence, as well as operational diligence, because we feel uh, that these, are, these two elements really help drive better investment decisions for our clients, as well as uh, better integration and value creation planning. Um, and execution. So, for I'll, I'll provide a quick overview of, of what each of these uh, types of diligence are, what they cover, and the insights that they provide. So, for from a commercial and market diligence perspective, um, what we look at is uh, an in-depth analysis and, and dive into the target's industry, its customers, its competition. Um, we assess the strategic plans and essentially the long-term commercial viability of the business uh, and, uh, the, and, the, and the industry. And what we're trying to do during the diligence phase is we're trying to identify what key assumptions management has made uh, in relation to their business. And, and we essentially pressure test those uh, against uh, um, external uh, data that we, that we compile. And it's very objective. And we also essentially, you know, we, we, we also interview um, customers, we conduct customer surveys, as well as interview industry experts to help validate uh, the insights that we're getting through our data analysis. And then we're uh, trying to find go no go kind of situations that go against the investment pieces that management that our clients have, um, have developed for the target. And providing these insights upfront really uh, you know, informs our, our clients of, of understanding if this is the right business for the industry or if the industry is not what they thought it was. And, and essentially it helps fine tune valuations and go forward strategy for our clients in relation to the target. Um, so that's kind of in, in the diligence phase. And then as well, the insights that we provide our clients, they help uh, guide the future value creation opportunities um, uh, that that our clients had thought about. So an example would, would be that you know if uh, you know if they had estimated if they had uh, hypothesized that they could take the existing products and services that the target has and expand into a certain vertical, and then through our diligence, commercial diligence, we identify that the vertical that they were actually going after is not the one that they should be. Um, it, 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 uh, better opportunities and another vertical or maybe a geographical expansion, we can help adjust 
the value creation op opportunities accordingly post close to ensure that we're not going after something that doesn't exist. And yes, and it, it also helps uh, with allocating resources and capital um, accordingly as well. And it also helps uh, formulate the operating model and integration blueprint that uh, that our clients kind of think through. So back to the uh, the vertical example, like if uh, you know if if they had thought that they would need to hire a new salesperson um, uh, post close to be able to go after that certain vertical, it might be actually, you no, know, you need to hire a new salesperson in, in a certain geography to kind of go after that market within the same existing vertical that the, the, the company's currently operating in. So uh, it helps kind of drive that level of thinking uh, post close as well. Um, the next one that we really push with, with our clients, uh, and this is a lot to do with uh, getting rid identifying and dealing with all a lot of the inherent integration risks that we covered earlier. Um, and, and, that and that's addressed with our operational due diligence, where we uh, do a deep dive in our in the target's current uh, current operating um, operating segment. Essentially, we look at it uh, at, at a functional level um, at, at the target and assess, you know, what are the what are the services that are being provided at, by each function? What is the structure, cost structure, head, um, and the headcount within each function, and then the contracts that they have. And we're also looking at how the how each of the functions benchmark against. Um, peers within within that segment. So trying to identify if there's potential synergies where they might be um, um, you know, over in terms of costs associated with HR, for instance, where they maybe have too many HR folks or the costs associated with their contracts with the HR provider is, is higher than what we expect for a company and industry of their size. Um, so we, uh, we, we help kind of uncover a lot of that. And then we also, uh, through that process, identify operational and integration risks that come up. So it could be when we assess, um, you know, back to the HR, when we're assessing the HR function and we look through the, the benefits and the benefits contracts, for instance, and we realize that the, the benefits that the target has is different than what, what our client has. And there's a likelihood that you know our client would need to um, pay extra or to the to the employees that we're bringing in. A lot of that uh, would be captured within that type, you know, with that with that with our operational diligence. So what it provides for our, during the due diligence phase, essentially, it provides a view on how effective and efficient the target is. Uh, in terms of at, at a functional level, as, as it relates to their peer sets. Uh, we also provide risks and related um, capabilities in terms of uh, for, to, for, the, for the target to support the growth initiatives that our client has, uh, has thought about or their go forward strategy. And it provides a view on what the one time and ongoing costs would be. Um, in, in, to make the structural changes to essentially enable the uh, go forward strategy that a client has come up with. And then as well, it also provides a view on uh, synergies at a functional level that the client, that our client kind of taken and make a more informed bid on. So a lot of insights is provided uh, during the diligence stage. And a lot of that, the findings of our diligence feeds into our functional level uh, integration planning. And essentially the, the, the objective is all of the functional level uh, uh, insights, risks and opportunities that we capture during the diligence phase feed into the planning, the integration, the functional level integration planning um, that, we, uh, that we support our clients with and then help execute. And with the view that we're trying to mitigate as much of the inherent risks associated with integrations um, as possible. So yeah, those are the two that you know we we feel that uh, clients can do um, uh, upfront and spend a, a bit more time and resources to kind of uncover a lot of these risks that they would uh, discover once they've actually taken over the business uh, or once they're starting to kind of integrate the business. And uh, you know, as and as discussed earlier, if you do that post close, then you're kind of uh, 
you know, you're doing you're doing two jobs at, at once versus uh, uh, if you do this upfront, you can then follow on and, and focus more on the value creation piece uh, once you've acquired the business. So key takeaways for our uh, for our buy side, um, I mean, you know, we recommend uh, to our clients that they look beyond the traditional route of uh, just doing diligence on financial information and including uh, you know market and operational diligence early in the process. And as we as we mentioned, you know, it, it provides critical insights at the diligence stage to inform a better bid uh, and, and it helps to drive successful integration and, and value creation program over the long term. And and then as well, you know, use the findings uh, from the market and operational diligence to you know anal analyze and adjust existing and planned strategic initiatives of, of, of the target. Um, and, and lastly, and I think this is important, is uh, you know, planning for integrations early uh, and ensuring you have sufficient resources is key, both internal and external, um, especially uh, if it's your first uh, transaction um, or you, you, know, you haven't gone through an integration. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's worth the investment to you know, bring in folks that have been there, done that, um, you know, uh, to kind of help guide some of this thinking. Um, you know, and, and otherwise, you, you're putting um, your company and the target uh, at risk. So that's you know that's what I wanted that's what I wanted to cover from a from a buy side perspective. Um, I'll move to the sell side piece, and then we'll open up to QA. So for sell side value creation, um, what I wanted to discuss today is is our. Um, is, is the approach that we take uh, at BDO to ensure that to ensure that we maximize transaction value for our, for our clients, and uh, you know and you know we push clients uh, you know they, you know they come to us and they're quickly wanting to maybe perhaps go to go to uh, go to market or they want rapid performance improvement and then sell within two to three months or six months, and we try to you know try to provide a more longer more strategic view on how they should look at maximizing their the, the value of their business and um, you know we have like we, and we focus on three elements so to help drive that goal uh, the, the first and the most important in my view uh, step is essentially uh, it is for the is for the owners to you know uh, to have a clear understanding of what the current m a market dynamics are um, and identify who their, the universe of their potential buyers for their business. And then as well, get aligned on what the value drivers are of their business in respect to the buyers that could be buying, that would be potential buyers of their business. Um, and once we've had the, the value drivers identified, for us, you know, we help support our clients in, in identifying new strategic priorities that align to those value drivers. As well, we help um, clients, you know, uh, review their existing um, uh, strategic priorities and, and, and long-term plans to, and then adjust them to ensure that they're aligned with, with the value drivers that we've identified. Um, and I think, and we, you know, we feel that this is critical. Um, and you know, and and this could be in form of, uh, you know, driving revenue in a certain in a certain segment uh, or expanding into a new um, segment, doing cost reduction and other value creation, but all with the view of tying all of that to the value drivers of the business. And then once you have that in order. You know, it's uh, the last piece is is being prepared for the transaction. So you know, getting your uh, BDD in order and your financial information as well as all your tax planning uh, completed um, is as well very critical. And then as a result, I think if you execute on these three steps, um, you're able to you're able to increase your chances of maximizing uh, the returns that you can get for your business. And what we typically see in, 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 in practice is that companies will start uh, focusing heavily on trying to improve their EBITDA and, and cutting costs or just trying to grow revenue without actually understanding um, if, the, if those initiatives are aligning to the value drivers of their potential buyers because they haven't really done that upfront um, analysis. Um, so it's, 
it's kind of it, it's it's wasted resources um, in our view uh, to to be able to just um, you know blindly kind of go and cut costs or or uh, aggressively try to grow revenue if it's not really adding to the value of the business. So I'll so the, so the next piece I want to cover is you know is what are value drivers. Um, so I wanted to kind of provide a you know like an academic view of of what value drivers are. Um, and then, um, you know, and then they vary, you know, industry for industry, but the, uh, the two value drivers that kind of are uh, relevant across all industries and they drive the intrinsic value of the business is, is this ability to have sustained revenue growth is number one. So top line revenue growth. And it's and then the second one is have the, um, the ability to sustain profitability over the long term. So return on investment capital. And these are the two levers that management has essentially uh, within, uh, within, uh, within their control to continuously drive value to their business. Um, and the way, uh, the way uh, academically to look at this is that there's um, short-term value drivers that look at, uh, and these are easy to track. They're uh, things that you can track within over over a monthly and uh, uh, over a monthly and quarterly period, um, and 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 each one of these drive are, are tied to either uh, the company's ability to have sustained revenue growth or profitability. So, for example, um, for revenue, a short-term value driver is is, is uh, sales productivity. So it's it's uh, the company's ability. It's looking at the company's recent sales growth and comparing it to uh, the industry, or looking at its ability to uh, charge higher prices than its peer set. Uh, and obviously if that is, if you're growing at a faster rate than the industry and you're charging higher prices, obviously you're doing a lot better and, that, and then uh, that better than your peer set and, and uh, buyers will obviously consider you as a, um, as in terms of a higher value type of a business in that regard. Operating costs, productivity looks at your ability to control direct material and SGNA costs in comparison to your peer set over the short term. Um, capital productivity is, would be in the short term, uh, the company's ability to manage its working capital uh, in comparison to its peer set, the level of inventory that it has, for instance, things like that. So uh, these are more short term, easily uh, measurable uh, value drivers that uh, you know management kind of should kind of consider thinking through as they're kind of thinking more on you know uh, their medium term and long term value drivers. Um, medium term value drivers are more forward looking value drivers that uh, assesses management's ability to maintain revenue growth and profitability. These are a bit harder to track, but for example, from a, uh, the commercial health value driver, for instance speaks to the company's ability to uh, successfully adjust and upgrade their products and services to stay relevant over the medium term. So if you have a business, if you have a product, but the, the, um, the, the requirement of the industry of the, the customers is changing is, you know, are you able to change that product or service to adjust and, uh, on an ongoing basis to be able to service that customer that's also changing. So it's you know, looking at your business capability of doing that, and you know, investors are really keen in understanding that because um, you know, if they're going to own you for a minimum of five year, five years, they want to be able to see that you're able to continuously upgrade your products and services and continue and sell to your to your customer base. Um, your you know your cost uh, structure health. It's your ability over the over uh, the three to five year period to manage your gross margin and SGNA. Um, in line or better than your comp your competitors, and asset health in the medium terms would be looking at your operational KPIs in terms of how efficient you are in in your plan in in, in producing what you produce and utilizing your plan, for instance. Um, so um, in terms of how, how much you're producing on an hourly basis, on a monthly basis, on a, a per labor basis. So you can get a lot more detailed in that regard. So these are more medium term. Uh, three to five year value drivers that investors would look at. Um, and then the, the longer term uh, value drivers are 
you know, more 10 years and plus. And it's, and, and these look at, uh, you know, the company's ability to essentially shift and break into new products and seg segments and, uh, at, and at the same time maintain and grow its core business operations. Because um, over the long run, you know, if you can't do that, then it's, you know, you're eventually going to be, um, you know, uh, out of business, right? So like a blockbuster, for instance, you know, they weren't able to do that, right? They weren't able to expand and, 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 and grow into um, what Netflix obviously became. And, and now they're gone, right? So it's the, biz, the ability to continuously kind of look forward in 10 years, to term assessing where your business needs to be and then dry, and then coming up with medium and short-term value drivers that are feeding to your long-term goal. Um, so these short-term, medium-term and long-term value drivers, they vary greatly by industry and size of your business. Um, and then as well, the importance of the importance and relevance to these value drivers to the value of your business also depends on the potential acquire. So for some, it's all about top line growth. You know, they want to be able to um, look at a business that's continues to growing when they're not too concerned about profitability. And top line growth could be just a measure of how many users or net new users the client has, but they're not um, too concerned about profitability at this stage. You know, that, that's typical of a, of a tech company, for instance. Um, so, so understanding that dynamic um, of who your buyers are and what they're actually looking for in a business in terms of what the value drivers are is helps formulate your strategy. It's almost um, you're doing a commercial and operational diligence on your business before it goes to market to actually pressure test um, to see if you, you know, if you can stand up to that level of diligence once, uh, once you do go to market. Um, so for, so key takeaways from a, from a sell side perspective, um, you know, investors will only pay for growth plans if, uh, if management is able to prove and highlight their continued ability to develop, execute, and report on successful growth in the past. You know, if you go to investors uh, within brand new growth strategy saying you're going to double your uh, revenue and you have no history of doing that, uh, that's not going to be something that investors are going to pay for. Um, we, we, you know, we try to advise clients uh, that, you know, that haven't done that level of growth not to go to market, um, but instead, you know, uh, develop a strategy, execute it, track it, and then uh, once you've done that, which might last over a year, two years, then you perhaps come up with a new strategy for even further growth. And then you can go to with the market with the tangible evidence of your ability to actually execute. Um, the second is essentially uh, what we just discussed is that you know, understanding your, your value drivers and their relevance to your, the value of your business is absolutely critical, uh, both from getting the uh, value that you want, as well as the efficient use of resources and capital within the business. Um, and lastly, um, I would say that, you know, you know, increasing EBITDA and focusing all your efforts on that might not be the best way to drive value within the business. Um, aligning your medium and long-term value drivers to key growth trends can, uh, can help expand your EBITDA multiple, which will result in a much higher valuation for your business versus trying to get a, a lower multiple with a, with, you know, with a, with a marginal increase in, in EBITDA. So that's the key takeaway for our, for our sell side valuation. Uh, I know I've talked a lot, but, um, just wanted to say thank you for uh, thank you for the time and um, appreciate the opportunity and um, I'm uh, really enjoy and are passionate about helping our clients both on buy side and and sell side value creation so um, or just talking to professionals and then just uh, you know sharing ideas so happy to do that more um, I mean, after this call with anyone who's interested but uh, I'm happy to uh, take any questions that the group might have at this stage. And just a reminder, if you have questions for Omar, uh, feel free to type them into the Q&A um, um, button at the bottom, or you can raise your hand and Lorene uh, will open your mic and uh, you can have a conversation and, and uh, ask your question uh, in person, so to speak. 
I do believe, Omar, that we had a question come through the um, chat uh, function. Uh, oh. Let me, why don't I read it? Because I think it only went to the panelists. So um, the question is, I've heard many times that 60% of acquisitions or acquisition, acquisitions actually fail or take way longer to integrate. This is a problem when you use mostly debt to buy companies. Can you confirm that stat? Yeah, I don't know if I can confirm the uh, the, the latter part of, of that question around uh, like it would be only a problem if you use debt. Um, I think you know layering on debt on any transaction does increase the risk associated with that transaction, and and then it, and it, I think it emphasizes the um, you know the value creation and synergy realization uh, requirement of the transaction. So I think. Um, the first part around 60% uh, of acquisitions fail. I think, you know, we, you know, we, I think it's higher, right? Like we're, we're saying between 70, 90 fail to, you know, to the value uh, that was expected. And I think if you just layer on more and more debt, I think it, it, it uh, amplifies that issue, you know, a lot of those risks because uh, there's obviously a lot more pressure on management to deliver. So if you don't actually do the planning, um, up front, it can, it can uh, having that additional layer of debt and the interest payments associated with that can really put your business at, at a higher risk. I think that's a, a good point, Omar, in terms of uh, what does actual failure of the, uh, of the acquisition mean? Is it failure to achieve the value you had hoped for or a complete failure of the business? So that's a good point. Um, you see another question there in the chat. Um, the question is, what can a business do to attract above market prices for its goods and services? That's a good question. Um, I think uh, uh, one of the one of the strategies that we try to uh, uh, think get get our clients to, to think through is, you know, what are they really uh, good at, or what are you know what are the few products and services that they're exception that, that that they can help differentiate themselves against their competitors? Because a lot of times, you know, companies will try to do will sell uh, um, a wide spectrum of goods and services and try to compete against um, against their competitors across all, um, and that leads to uh, you know as, as mentioned, inefficient use of internal uh, resources and capital. Where we say, okay, you know, where can you? Let's do a detailed assessment of your portfolio of goods and services, and 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 figure out where you can, you know, where you're stronger than your peer set, and then really um, invest in ones that you know we can win at continuously, and then deliver and and and, uh, and and help try to differentiate yourself against your competitors for those few products and services, and then really invest your marketing and, and, and kind of um, sales or marketing as well as your product development into those to then be able to drive you know higher prices in, in that regard because you're you're delivering the best product you're delivering the best services associated with um, you know support services associated with that product um, and then you're you know that's so that's kind of how you how you can start thinking about that um, and, and obviously it's like a long kind of process and you know testing and tr trial and error but you know that's kind of how we how we do that you know and simply i think part of it is also a simple exercise is you have to look at your current customers and maybe and segment them out in terms of uh, who your big customers are where you're getting a lot more of your revenue and your smaller customers and some of your smaller customers maybe it's testing to see if you can increase your prices with them um, without, and then perhaps they stick and they continue because um, you're obviously, you're likely spending, you're still, you're internally as a company still spending time um, servicing that customer segment, but they're only generating a small portion of your revenue. So you're, it's, you know, you can try to increase those prices um, as compared to your larger customers to see if it sticks. And that could be one way and you're okay with, with, perhaps maybe losing that customer in, 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 the, uh, in the short term. Great. Um, 
Another question in the, the Q&A function. Um, how, in your opinion, should one assess the target's management potential, given that there may not be access to them in the pre-deal due diligence period? Yeah, this, this is a good, good question. So the way we get around this is, um, uh, if not, you know, uh, managements, uh, direct managements, but we can see uh, the uh, we can go and uh, do interviews of the target's customers, um, as well as uh, do surveys of the of, um, of of a wide spectrum of customers in relation to our target's products and services uh, as they relate to other competitors to kind of gauge um, what the market thinks of our, of of, our, of the target. And, uh, in, and, and indirectly back to a management of the, of the target. So if we learn that you know, the customers aren't happy with, uh, with the target's sales organization because they don't have a good um, post-sale service, you know, uh, support services or their uh, you know, customer services isn't strong uh, and, you know, and, and they're looking to perhaps go to a competitor, all those kind of would indicate um, you know, would indicate that there's an issue within within the target as well. Uh, I think looking at uh, historical performance of the business during the uh, you know recessionary periods uh, or or key you know periods within where there's been turbulence within uh, within the economy and how the how the business has held up during that stage is another indicator of how strong management is and. Um, and as well, you can also look at, as I was mentioning earlier, um, how um, you know how the how, how the company itself has been able to um, uh, create new products, launch new products, and successfully launch them in the market is also a good indicator of how strong management team is. Yeah, a good answer. Uh a couple more questions come came in through the Q and A. Um, uh, so, in this COVID environment, has BDO pivoted or changed their theory on how to work with clients to realize value creation opportunities for buy or sell clients? Um, I I would say that we're you know like everyone else we've. Uh, We've adjusted to work remotely, um, but I think a lot of the work that we do now hasn't changed greatly than what we were doing before. We're, you know, we're uh, our, our um, you know, our, our diligence, some of our commercial, commercial diligence work that we would do might require us to travel um, and, and be uh, on the, uh, be foot on the ground and to do, you know, customer surveys or or talk to customers uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so perhaps that is limited to just doing online surveys, but um, we're, we're always finding, um, you know, like everyone else, uh, ways to kind of uh, uh, continuously add value given the, the environment that we're all kind of operating under. Have you found post COVID gives, I guess, different opportunities? Oh, I shouldn't say post COVID, <laughs> in the middle of COVID, but have you found um, there's you now different opportunities at creating value for for clients or looking for value for clients given the current um, you know situation. I think it's very uh, business specific, but obviously, um, I think the what uh, investors in private equity in particular are looking at are now is how the business you know traditionally they would look at uh, how the business did over a recessionary period, but now they're also looking at. How, how did a business do during COVID, right? And um, what are some, you know, what were the what were the things that went wrong within the business? And then essentially ensuring that the business is structured in a way where if we were to go into another wave or another situation like COVID, that you're going to be able to sustain and, and kind of um, manage your business through that. So I think uh, it's very specific to the business and industry, but having that kind of thinking through your uh, strategic planning is, I think, more critical than, yeah, more critical now for sure, um, especially for businesses that are looking to perhaps exit in three to five years. I think that's something that um, investors will continue to look at going forward. Okay. 
another question that came through, should one focus on testing deal breakers first in a typical CDD rather than simply analyzing the market size and its attractiveness and other components of a CDD? Yeah, that's a good question. So the way we typically approach it is in the preliminary diligence stage, we would try to capture, we would do diligence on, um, so the question's point uh, around like the full spectrum around market uh, customers, uh, products and, and, and the target's competitive position in the market. And then as the, as the transaction progresses and whatever you know, insights that we learn, we tend to focus and get a lot more detailed in, in the key kind of uh, deal break, you know, key uh, issues or assumptions that we've kind of uh, highlighted that are core to the investment thesis or the, or the, or the, or the deal breakers, for instance. In, in the in the um, in the detail space, so this this would involve, you know, doing a lot more of the expert interviews to kind of help guide and, and validate some of our hypotheses that we developed in the preliminary diligence. Um, so I would say that we, um, we we test the deal breakers at at all respects, starting from the preliminary diligence, but we really go deep into those um, in the uh, detailed diligence phase between the EOI and, and um, right before LOI and then all the way up to signing, uh, we're kind of into the weeds and answering those critical questions to ensure that um, they're making the right investment. Thanks, Somer. I think the last question that's up there, we've actually answered before. It, it's, uh, I believe, the same one that came through the chat. So we had answered that earlier. Um, Unless anybody had any other questions, we're right on time in terms of it's just about to be one o'clock. So, um, so uh, we got a quick question in there, right, right on the under the timeline. So, uh, if you could maybe quickly answer Omar, best practices for constructing a value driver tree for a CDD. Um, I'm sure, if I understand the question, but like. Um... If the question is like related to answering the critical questions um, of of a, of a CV engagement, I, I think it's like um, you know it's breaking each each of those components down as to what we need to answer. Sorry, I'm, I don't maybe I don't understand the question, uh, but um, but I think it's really yeah I think defining what the critical questions are that management has, and sometimes management doesn't know that until we start going in and doing the preliminary. Uh, you know, commercial diligence on the sim and what the what management is indicating in terms of their uh, potential performance in terms of revenue growth and EBITDA. And then from there, what we uncover really drive uh, what we focus in on in terms of uh, the more detailed diligence and answering the, 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 the key questions. I think that's a, a good answer. And if they were looking for something else, uh, there's your contact information right up there so they can, uh, I'm sure, reach out to you directly to, to get some more details. For sure. Okay, well, I uh, appreciate everyone's time. We uh, really, um, you know, thank you for continuing to support the M&A Club and the Hamilton M&A Club. We uh, are looking forward to seeing people in person again sometime soon, hopefully. Um, and with that, we'll wrap things up. Uh, Omar or Jeff, any, anything to add or? I just want to say thanks again for that to the M&A Club. I uh, appreciate the opportunity and thanks for everyone for uh, spending the lunch hour with us. And uh, I hope uh, there's some good insights for you and yeah, happy to answer any questions that Pam, as you mentioned, um, that the group might have. So thanks again. Thank you. Right. Well, on behalf of Jeremy and myself, uh, thank you, Armour. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you, everyone.